Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. So today I'll talk uh, about the technical aspect of large language models. Surprise. So, but first, you know, we released Galactica's uh, scientific language model one, one year ago this week, which means ChatGPT was not released one year ago. At what moment of the history we had a technology created in Silicon Valley, the west of America, that in less than a year has been adopted by top developers to the far end of India. I think that's just unprecedented scale. So I'll start with a brief history. I mean, this is a very uh, new field. Um, so first, what is a large language model? What is just a language model? Language models is a model, in general, a transformer. You all heard about that. Compu it's based on weights, the parameters, combined with the data. So data is what? All the tokens in the internet, all the words in the internet. And we train that on a task, which is a next token prediction. Basically, you have this architecture, the transformer, that is trained to predict the next word of all the text in the internet. Let me give you an intuition of why this is working. Um, if you are naive and you try to predict uh, the next word, and I give you, I don't know, like millions of examples about calculus. 3 plus 3 equals 6, 4 plus 4 equals 8, and you try to predict what is after the equal. This is the task of, the task of next token prediction. If you are naive, you can just memorize everything. That's a way to learn to predict the next token. Now, if you compress the, what is underneath the data, the true uh, algorithm that explains the next token, well, the most beautiful compression here will be to, un to compress the algorithm of calculus. Of some. And this is my intuition of what those algorithms are doing. Based on weights trained on data, they compress the log of the thoughts of humanity, which is text. So there's two things about um, scaling. You can scale the weight, or you can scale the data. More words, more text, it's a dimension of scaling. And the architecture, the weight, is the other dimension. In early days, for GPT-3, OpenAI did some scaling laws. They tested, so basically, the batch size, um, which is scaling the number of tokens, the words. They tested other things like the weight. And what they found is scale is working. You get better results by scaling, by scaling mostly the weights, not the data. So this is what they found here, for instance, on a question answering task. Just it's the beauty of this. You apply the same recipe, a transformer predicting the next token. Just you scale, which means the same recipe with just an architecture with more weight. And you get some improvement consistently. Yet they had done a small mistake that was um, explained in the Chinchilla paper. They thought we should scale only the weights, but that was, there was a mistake when they did the experimental protocol. And in fact, you should scale not only the weights, but also the data. And there are some rules. So, what was really nice in this paper, Chinchilla from DeepMind, was they trained uh, before a Gopher. That was a model of 270 billion parameters with some huge amount of compute. And what they did is they did at small scale, uh, below like 10 billion parameters, a lot of experiments. And they figured out some laws, some scaling laws, that given a compute you, that you have, let's say the same than Gopher, actually there's a balance to follow, which is Maybe a smaller model with more tokens, so for the same exact compute, you will get better results. This is what they did. And just extrapolating for them from their laws, their empirical laws, they trained Chinchilla, a 70 billion model, that get better results than Gopher, as expected. So you should scale the weights, but also the data. Yet, I think Lama is about rethinking compute optimal. So, Chinchilla, you know, you have a compute. Your goal is to get in a research paper the best results 
to given a compute which is fixed. But truth is, if you want your model to be used by a lot of people, which I hope is the case for most of the people uh, doing research, the thing is, scaling the weights, you have two dimensions again, the data and the weights. If you scale the weights, more weights, bigger architectures, cost more at inference time when you use in practice the model. Scaling the data, it doesn't cost most. It's just a dimension that you can remove at inference time. And so, Lama is about rethinking compute optimal by kind of over, um, it's like beyond the chinchilla trap, as we say uh, in the research community. Like, you don't want to get to the best result in your paper. Maybe that for the same amount of compute, we'll have get better scores at Meta. But you can see here the training loss that still decreases. And so you can continue to train with even more compute, the small models, and get good results. And so this is what we had. It, it was also released in a non-commercial way, but for the first time, the research community had access to a larger language model. That is good. And it's also small, so there are some people that already put that in like some C++, Raspberries, and on running on phones. It, it had uh, lead to like more than 7,000 research projects based on that. But it was released in a non-commercial way. It was not a chat model, just a base model. And so we worked on Lama 2, but we released uh, last July. I'll deep dive on the new technology that we did for Lama 2 compared to Lama 1, which is mostly the chat aspect, what we call RLHF instruction tunings. So when we train with these models, starting from a base model, a pre-trained model, how to align that with respect to human preference and to become like a chat model. You ask annotators to create data. They write a prompt, a question, and the answer that you will have wanted ChatGPT to answer you. This is like supervised fine tuning. It's standard in machine learning. And the thing here is you have to get some annotators that are very creative and high quality. Like, I could not find this kind of uh, diversity in the examples. I would write a poem uh, for the table of uh, materials. But you have a second method, which is based on human preference. Human preference is leveraging the language model itself, so that the annotators just write the prompt, and we generate two answers from the models that we have, and we just ask the, the human annotators which one it, he prefers. If you ask me at the beginning of the project, I would say, I prefer supervised fine tuning. It's gold data annotated only by human, not by, by a model. But this costs like 10 times less because the annotator doesn't have to write the output. So maybe it scales better. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So the amazing thing about a reward model, though, training, so because when you have the classification between like a, the human preference, this is a good output, this is a bad output, this is just training a classifier, what we call a reward model. So that the model is, is trained to say, this is a good output, this is a bad output. And you know, like, evaluating chat models is extraordinarily difficult. It's like, by definition, by construction, multitask models. But evaluating a classification model is trivial. It's binary, true or false. And so with more data, we could see that we increase the results for lama 2 of our reward model, meaning that for the same recipe, Applying a better reward model will lead to better chat models. Here is an intuition of reinforcement learning with human preference. If you have your uh, prompt, a question, and you sample from one to 100 examples, well, the median, if you take any of the outputs, it won't change. The score is consistent from your classification. But if you take the, mass, the maximum among all the trajectories, among all the outputs that your model have generated, well, it's increased because you are more likely to generate a trajectory which is better than the others. And so reinforcement learning here, we developed a re rejection sampling algorithm. It's just to generate a lot of uh, sequences, take the max, train your model on that, and so the potential gain of the algorithm is the gap between the max and the median. We had some relative improvements during all the projects. And so you can see that the distribution with respect to the reward model shift to the right, meaning that our outputs are now better and better according to our reward model. So here is a 
progress through the project. In fact, I think we went quite fast from uh, when we started in February to the July release. Uh, you have all our iterative progress, and we measured the, the results using as a judge GPT-4. And we compare the win rate between ChatGPT from OpenAI and our model. And so we asked GPT-4, this is the two outputs, which one do you prefer for helpfulness and with respect to safety? And at the end of the project, before the release, we reached to something which means more than 50%. According to GPT-4 OpenAI model, our model is better on both dimensions than ChatGPT. So here is a cool example of uh, temporal perception emergence uh, that we observed. And I was surprised by It's like the small three lines uh, poems uh, in Japanese about large language models. I will give you like 10 seconds to think what you can come with. I try to find a good haiku for large language models, like three lines, few words. And I don't know if someone came with something good. I could spend an hour and not find anything great. And yet, this is what, in like one second, our language model generated. And to me, this is pretty good. And what we found out during the project, that very soon we are super surprised that the outputs of our model, when we evaluated them compared to the human annotation, it was better. We were like, maybe the annotators are not good. And the truth is that the language model is already better than most of the humans at writing tasks. And so the true magic behind LLHF is not reinforcement learning, it's not human feedback. It's to give a tool to humans to create data at a superhuman level performance that no human could create. And so the future directions in this regard would be about not reinforcement learning or human feedback, but how can we leverage these models to create, in synergy with humans or not, some new data that will become even more and more complex and better. So let me tell you now, to finish this talk, about what I believe will come next. First thing is uh, multimodality. This has started. You have seen, like, for instance, on OpenAI, um, like GPTV with the vision to process some image inputs. Meta released some multimodal uh, models with image edit yesterday. This is just the beginning. Um, we are clearly going to a direction where, you know, like five years ago when I started my PhD, we were like developing new architectures and research papers were about proposing new architectures. Nowadays, it's only transformers. And we apply transformers on language model. We apply transformers on uh, image, on speech. And so we are progressively moving to like aligning all those modalities in a single model. It's not yet, yet the case, but we are going there. There's a lot of engineering things for which we know from the research perspective it is working. And like you can connect uh, generating image as a tool. This is what OpenAI just did, and that works pre pretty well. You can connect image uh, modalities in a fully connected way to the model. That works well as well. Now there's yet some research questions like, what about generating long form videos? Imagine to not ask like uh, Lamatu or ChatGPT to generate a text or a summary, but now a video and you can query it, question it on the fly. We are not there yet, and there's some of research questions that remains open. One of the second big directions is about 
um, give, giving access to the web, to those models, and more generally giving access to tools. Like tools is something very unique for humans. Like we are kind of going beyond our capabilities by creating tools. That's what we have done in the history of humanity. And right now we are giving access for the first time to tools to the language models. Like you have seen like the plugins. One month before that, uh, from the release of OpenAI at Meta, we had Toolformer paper, created tools to transformers. And that goes beyond what a language model is capable of, beyond the weights of the model's abilities. By, I mean, something very simple to say and silly, like, why asking the language model, ChatGPT, to do some calculus, some sum, which requires like multi billions matrix calculus, if you can just give it access to a calculator? But you see, like, now you can have also access to the web and so updated content and augmented output, expert output. And soon you can expect also this language model to create their own tools with some, because they have some ability to code and to program. And so that's an all new uh, universe of, for research and products. Research because right now, those language models are trying to predict what comes after the, some text, some data we extracted from the web, as like next token prediction. Like, let me give you an example. If now I predict something, like so, some code, I said, oh, I want to lower uh, case all my text. And the model generates a code to do that. But now he can execute the code, see what an input gives as an, and what is the output from the real world grounded in code execution. Then the language model can re reflect its own expectations. And so the last thing is robotics. This is much more like long term, yet it has started quick, uh, sm uh, slowly. OpenAI invested 20 million in a robotic company. Tesla is pre pretty well positioned with their uh, technology. And we had seen some paper connecting language models to robots and indicating some good results. I don't know how fast it will go, but this is a clear direction. And you can expect just the same way you can ground language models to like reality in a digital world with like code execution, search engine, etc. You can go to the next level, grounding it into the reality with like some sensors of the real force that acts here. So, also a new breakthrough is unexpected. Like, what this decade of AI told us is there's something unlikely that will happen for sure. What it is, I cannot tell you. Well, I don't take a lot of risk here. Uh, but I'm pretty sure in the next three years, something that no one saw coming will emerge. But there's something which is highly predicted, highly predictable. Compute. Um, I mean, compute is like so in demography in social science. This is a force that we can predict from like the last 50 years with the Moore's law, and now it's accelerating with even more and more compute. Uh, Jensen from NVIDIA will not tell uh, the opposite. And um, the thing is, we are getting more and more compute into those models. And the biggest question is, are these language models, stochastic parrot, just generating text uh, as a parrot? Or are they truly understanding the underneath behind the data? And so that's the big question. Some people think that compute is all you need, scale is all you need, and with more compute, the same recipe will keep increasing and give better results. Some people think it's not the case. I don't know. I think the fact that uh, this model can compress information in such a beautiful way can mean they yet understand what is behind the data. Will it be enough? I don't know. Um, yet, what I can tell you is that we haven't finished with the scaling laws, and we can put more compute in the small models, in the bigger models. We will have, for sure, in the next five years, better and better models with the same recipe. And so, I will conclude with Maybe we had the Copernicus moment of uh, intelligence. Like, you know, Copernicus was like, um, after finding that Earth is nothing special, a normal planet uh, orbiting a normal star in a normal galaxy. Maybe, we don't know, uh, we will learn that intelligence is nothing too crazy as well. It's just a bunch of matrix, matrix multiplications. Thank you. 
Thank you, Thomas.